The world is on fire and people are starting to get terrified. As heat waves ravage southern Europe and numerous other places around the globe are facing record temperatures, people's eyes are being well and truly opened to the disaster that could be approaching us. And it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. Due to sanctions on Russian exports, natural resources are scarce and the cost of living is rising as a result. In order to stop this, governments have resorted back to an old foe of the environment. The demand for South African coal is on the rise, and Germany is planning a return to carbon, which has largely petered out in recent years due to its harmful impact on the environment. But is there any other alternative? Is this the new normal, or is there still time to change it? Should we sacrifice sanctioning Russia in order to save the planet? And as the world hots up and we need more energy to stay cool, which is harming the environment, to put it simply, are we trapped in a cycle of climate destruction? So let's get to it. Are we trapped in the cycle of climate destruction? Dear panelists, you know the rules. You each get 30 seconds to lay out your initial stance and we pick up the debate uh, right after. So Hila, please take the lead. Hey, thank you for having me. So climate change is probably humanity's biggest threat that humanity have ever seen. We see the fires, we see the floods. And if our leaders will not lead and take action right away, yes. The world is going to be a disaster. The world on Earth in 2050 is going to be a living hell with increasing population density, cars on the road. The industry that pollutes is going to double itself and with it the pollution. Well, uh, Harry, can you match uh, this dire prediction? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with Hela. Um, in fact, uh, we, we are not too late. Uh, still, we have plenty of time to go. I mean, uh, the, the, the limit that was set up uh, is one, uh, 1.5 degrees C, and we haven't reached that yet. Uh, we are in the range of 1.1 or 1.2 right now um, uh, over the last uh, 300 years. Um, so uh, we still have some, some time for it, but we have to act quickly. Um, uh, the, the the plan was to to cut down the the the, uh, the carbon emission, but it's it's going to take some time yes. to to achieve that. And we'll 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 talk on all the uh, potential routes of actions uh, to do just that in a split second. Uh, but less than definitely not uh, least, uh, Gina, your take. So I don't necessarily agree. Um, indeed, the climate has increased by 1.1 degrees in the last 120 years. But the main reason for that is that the population of the world has grown five times. The world has moved to industrialization and urbanization. Um, the, 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 stat, the statistics are that it will take doubling of the CO2 for the climate to increase by another 1.1 degrees. The most urgent issue is to get the energy systems right of the world. That is much more true. Fascinating. And uh, from this point onwards, uh, panelists, please feel free uh, to interact. And now uh, let's begin uh, by talking about uh, the latest uh, directive or announcement, rather, by U.S. President uh, Joe Biden, uh, announcing several climate actions, but not declaring a climate emergency. Now, it's not merely terminology. Uh, declaring a state of emergency means cutting a whole lot of red tape and all those other uh, uh, perks, quote unquote. Why the wait, uh, Harry? Well, um, President Biden, actually, he called it an exponential threat, but he stopped short actually calling it, uh, uh, you know, uh, calling for an emergency, um, uh, you know. Um, uh, situation, yeah. Situation, yes. Uh, I, I think he, he's right. I mean, th th we have to balance between two things right now, uh, what is happening in the world. One is uh, the climate change, which is a long-term uh, issue for us. And second is the uh, inflation and the recession that we are expecting to happen uh, in the economies uh, 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 worldwide. So we have to balance between the two, uh, in fact. And uh, Hila, you know, banning U.S. crude oil experts, ending offshore drilling, these are political bombshells, really. And who on earth literally would ever do that voluntarily if we're looking at it from the politician's standpoint? It's suicidal almost. 
That's a great point, Ali, and nobody is going to do it voluntarily. This is why we need environmental policies in line. History has showed us that people and corporation respond to environmental policy. We saw it with the Clean Air Act and the CAFE standard, the Corporate Evil Fuel Economy that passed in 1970, that successfully cleaned local air, local air pollutant and created um, gas efficient cars. So that's what we need. We need a price on carbon. We need to transform the world economy at speed and scale more urgent than ever before. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Gina, uh, truly necessary and urgent? Well, Biden didn't declare the state of emergency, and no president in America before him has declared such a state either. Um, he didn't declare it because, uh, like Harry said, you need a balance, a balance between um, um, energy security, between what is happening in the climate, between recession, because the second reason, because he can't declare it. He has been unsuccessful so far to pass any long-range and strong climate policies, mostly because of the uh, Senate motion, who holds a uh, the, the balance in, in, uh, of the vote, and also because he understands of past mistakes, which he had to retract, declaring uh, Saudi Arabia a pariah state, um, declaring that uh, he's not opening federal lands for oil and gas drilling. He has now retracted on, 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 on these decisions. What he has done, he has given uh, $2.3 billion um, to help uh, uh, the poorest communities. He's moving ahead with some wind farms. Uh, Probably we'll have to see what happens after the midterm elections in November. Yes, we're all waiting uh, for midterms. Let's uh, shift focus uh, for a second uh, to Europe, obviously all profoundly intertwined. And uh, the uh, uh, deteriorating energy crisis is colliding with this uh, scorching heat wave. And we're seeing some EU countries reversing back, going back to uh, coal. So uh, first, what will be the consequences of that? And uh, secondly, um, is the use uh, of coal, and meanwhile, will be enough to develop green energy, Harry? Harry. Well, um, yes, you are right. Um, uh, countries like Germany and Austria are thinking to go back and uh, recommission their uh, coal-fired power stations again. Uh, th th this is imminent. I, I mean, it's going to happen sooner or later, before winter. Uh, we know that, uh, for example, the Nord Stream 1 is back uh, in line, I think it was today. But uh, it's, it's not going to be enough for a country like Germany. So they have to uh, think in advance uh, how they are going to uh, tackle uh, next winter, uh, you know, uh, cold uh, yeah. and 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 breathing weather. So, uh, in in this sense, I think uh, Germany is taking uh, some pragmatic uh, um, approaches with the uh, uh, in terms of energy security. I, I think uh, many other countries will follow. Uh, uh, except, for example, uh, France. I think France is more secure right now because of, uh, you know, the nuclear power stations that they have. And, and uh, Gina, you know, we can't do it all. Uh, it's a matter of uh, resources. It's a matter of attention. And at this crossroads, what are the chances for EU leaders to turn their backs on Ukraine for the sake of solving or at least stabilizing the energy uh, crisis? Or, um, you know, more bluntly, as our senior producer Joe uh, Brown has phrased it, uh, will we be able to sacrifice sanctioning Russia for the sake of uh, saving the planet? Well, uh, the EU has made a decision to try and get the countries uh, to reduce their coal consumption by 15% on a voluntary basis. Um, this is going to affect each country differently because some countries are more dependent on Russia and some less. Indeed, France is less dependent, but they have uh, lots of problems with their nuclear facilities. So they are at a very difficult moment in time, both France and Germany today. Um, as long as the 15% reduction of consumption of, of gas is voluntarily the countries will speak uh, in uh, unilaterally and help each other. If a decision is made to enforce these requirements, then it is very possible that they're going to start turning against each other and turning against Ukraine. And, and each country will be for itself and will look after its own energy needs. There are um, policies within Europe to help countries if one has too much and one has too little and one has in storage and one doesn't have. It's all good as long as things succeed.
But Bulgaria has already declared in the last couple of days that they're not going to export any more gas. They're going to keep what they need for themselves. Mm. So I think that if policies become too strenuous, it's going to it's going to backfire on on on, on, the, on the countries in Europe. And you know what? Even uh, on more on a on a local sphere, you know, roads are literally melting in the UK, and 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 it goes back to my perhaps uh, or echoes uh, my previous uh, question, Ila. Uh, let's think of a mayor on any point of this globe who will say, you know what? I'm going to put my citizens, my uh, my residences uh, through hell on earth for several years because it will be beneficial at the end once infrastructure is back intact. Uh, again, in other words. How can climate become uh, more of a public desire rather than a dictation? How can we depoliticize climate, so to speak, Hila? It's very simple. All you need to do is look at the numbers. Um, we saw how governments and mayors acted on COVID-19, the pandemic. Hmm. If you think that COVID-19 hurt our economy, just wait and see what climate change will do to us. At least double the damage, reduce GDP. We saw in Portugal and Spain just this week from the heat wave over 1,169 deaths. This is not something in the future, it's happening now. As we sit here and speak today, our world is on fire again. And we have to take massive action in order to change it. And it has to be now. Harry, we're nearing at the end of this part of our uh, debate. Uh, final thoughts? Well, uh, I, I, th I think we need to be uh, more proactive, uh, but on the same time, we need to be uh, quite pragmatic uh, when, when it comes to the uh, energy security, especially uh, in countries where are, which are dependent on, uh, on Russian uh, gas. Uh, uh, and, and, and basically, they need to come with alternatives such as renewable energy as, uh, you know, to supersede the uh, uh, Russian gas. Gina, again, uh, we have a minute left until the break. Uh, final thoughts? Well, the world is on fire, but not for anthropogenic reasons. Namely, it is not man-caused, not energy-caused. A very, very small percentage of it is caused by energy and by anthropogenic reasons. 127,000 years ago, for 20,000 years, the, the world was two degrees hotter. <clears throat> Between 19, 19,010 and 19,040, the world was as hot as it is now, and then it cooled. Between 1940 and 1980. What is important is to get the facts correct, and we need more facts. We don't know. We don't have enough facts. We need to get more facts. We need to get better analysis. And we need to balance, like Harry says, we need to balance the need for security of supply, which is a, an acute and immediate need to take millions of people out of poverty and climate change, which is happening. But is it happening because of anthropogenic reasons or not? Balance is the key word to, to, to move ahead with. And we will continue to dive into this uh, very delicate and elusive uh, ba um, balance uh, right after uh, the uh, break. Uh, Hila Atkin, uh, Harry uh, Etopinian and uh, Gina Cohen, you're staying with us. We're taking a quick break and we'll be back with much, much more. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the summit. Uh, still with us, uh, Gina Cohen, Hila Atkin, and uh, Mr. Harry Stupini. And thank you all very much uh, for staying with us. We're staying on topic, of course. Let's uh, first take a listen to some of the uh, highlights of uh, remarks, if you will, uh, from global uh, officials uh, on this uh, topic. Some with uh, interesting uh, uh, suggestions on what we should focus on. There is um, a, a consensus around the notion that we need to get away from coal and we need to get away from fossil fuels as well. A war has created, as it always does, some very difficult trade-offs. It may be that to keep your economy moving today and create political stability sufficient to continue the reduction, that you temporarily have to uh, use some coal while you are building out your renewables. There are deaths almost on a daily basis worldwide. And it is clear these erratic weather patterns are a consequence of the climate crisis. And I think it's time we paid a bit more attention to those victims. And I think it would be a good idea to have at least one day in the year in Europe where we commemorate the victims of these horrible weather patterns caused by the climate crisis. 
Well, um, some are suggesting in light of uh, the uh, current state of affairs, you know what, maybe we all should say, we need to adapt to this new climate uh, reality. It is what it is. Uh, and we are the ones who need to change uh, our perception or our handling of the situation. So is it the new normal or is there still time to change it? Let's kickstart this uh, debate with another round of 30 seconds each and uh, pick up the conversation right after. Harry, take the lead, please. Um, yes, uh, I think we, we still will have time until 2050 uh, at least uh, to uh, get to uh, not uh, fully net zero uh, emission, but very close to it. And, and there will be uh, more advancement in the technologies, especially for renewable, um, take for example the solar and the wind, that probably will improve the efficiency of the renewable energy that will enhance or expedite the, um, uh, you know, achieving uh, the, uh, the, the goal. Gina, your thoughts? Well, I think that uh, renewable is important mostly for security of supply, for diversity and for energy independence. As we've seen, the dependence on, on Russia is, is nefarious and, and therefore renewables uh, uh, generated locally is important. Uh, as I said, the doubling of CO2 will increase the temperature by, by one degree to 1.5 degrees. It's not tragic. We can handle this. And yes, I agree with you. The world needs to, to adapt, adapt to the, to the different climate. We need to build homes which are more insulated, maybe not building homes next to the sea. So yeah, we need to change our behavior and we will continue that point uh, from this point exactly in a split second, uh, but uh, less than not least, uh, Hila. So we do have to adapt. Climate change will wipe species and entire societies of the planet. But I'm also optimistic about the future. At the moment, we have we need to emit, get to zero carbon by 2050. So emit one, so abate 100%. At the moment, we have 25% of technology ready to abate carbon and to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. We have 45% of this technology in climate tech, agri tech, and food tech ready to go out. Yeah. And we have 30% not yet invented. But uh, Hila, I would like to uh, reverse back to what uh, Gina said before uh, uh, the break, that we need to be a bit more accurate and or perhaps even careful with, uh, with hardcore data, with information, some of it perhaps misleading. And, and I would like to ask you, maybe uh, there is a certain mistake um, uh, of climate campaigners, uh, if you will, uh, similarly to the quote unquote mistakes made earlier underway, talking about baby steps, you know, we all need to recycle and save the planet. Maybe now this all or nothing um, uh, disastrous predictions are alienating um, uh, people uh, from the uh, joint cause. Look, Ellie, those climate events, the wildfires that we see in Europe, they don't just happen. They are caused by anthropogenic, by human-made emissions. We know that through history, Earth's new ice age and warmer periods, but scientists can go and track in ice and see what caused that. And we have consensus that emitting CO2 from burning fossil fuel is the cause for our warming global. If it was the sun, if it was variation in the sun, we would see warming from the surface to the atmosphere and the stratosphere, but that's not what we see. We see warming in the surface and actually cooling in the stratosphere, which is a signature, a clear sign that this is anthropogenic and greenhouse gas emissions fault. Gina, um, I'm curious to hear your take. Well, there aren't, there aren't more fires and there aren't more droughts in the last 20 years. In fact, the last 20 years, the fires have been tiny, a little bit below the average. Um, below some of the, uh, of the ice, uh, Roman ruins have been found. But um, the discussion has really run away from us because I think the world has decided that anthropogenic reasons are the cause for the climate, for the climate uh, change. Therefore, the only thing I can suggest is that, yes, we get more information. We have an open debate and not an aggressive debate hmm. between the two, the two groups and that we learn to adapt. Um, and yes, renewables are important. As I said, why not go for renewables if, if we can in order to be self-sufficient and, uh, and diversify our, our, our security of supply. But there should be a discussion and people should not be dismissed as, oh, they are climate deniers and therefore they should not be heard. So a discussion is very important, I think. 
Harry, uh, can we find a middle ground between uh, being a uh, climate uh, uh, apocalypse uh, um, uh, projector and uh, climate denier? Well, uh, yes. I mean, uh, we are witnessing, like Gia said, uh, some some climate changes. Uh, I mean, take Middle East uh, region, for example. Mm. We, we have seen the desertification. We have seen the water crisis. We have seen the uh, dust storms more frequent than uh, in the past. Uh, all these are indicators that uh, basically we are moving toward, uh, you know, uh, global warming. And, and, need, and we need to tackle it uh, in different ways. Um, uh, adaptation is one one way uh, of doing it. We, we know that uh, we probably we cannot put a break on on the uh, rising temperature, but we, we we can adapt as a human to the um, uh, the rise in the temperature. And uh, before we uh, conclude uh, this uh, debate, unfortunately, we're running uh, out of time. Simply put, who should we point our fingers at? Governments private companies, uh, how should we tackle uh, this uh, battle from this point uh, onwards, Hila? That's a good question, Elisa. There is a few things. One, we have to transform the world economy and we have to transform, we have to understand that the way we're living right now is not sustainable and we sacrifice future generation for our current joy. So this cannot be continued. Second, we have the this should, what happening in Europe is an alarm for policymakers. They are the one that decision makers that should lead. Leaders should lead. They should lead this transition and get us out of this climate catastrophe that we're living in. Gina, the focus of the coming year or years, let's say. Well, as I said, I don't think we are living through a catastrophe or calamity. I think that we need the leaders indeed to make decisions, but the leaders can only make, uh, they can only make the right noises, and then it is up to the private companies to make the investments. Um, if the leaders, for instance, in Europe say they want to diversify uh, their supplies of gas, it's the gas companies who need to buy the gas, who need to invest in the gas. So really the governments, the regulators, the private companies, the public and the media have to work all together and we have to first decide what is the goal that we want to reach. Um, the two goals are energy security of supply. There's still about uh, 30 to 40% of the world that is living in energy poverty. Billions of people that have no energy and are dying because of no energy. 400 million Chinese were taken out of starvation and energy poverty mm. thanks to, to fossil fuel. So this is also something very important. And it's not a matter of what is good today for the future. We have to work for the future for the next 30 years. We can't think a lot, a lot beyond that. In the next 30 years, it's obvious that we need fossil fuels. We have to move in tandem together with renewables and work together with an open dialogue without criticizing each other.